Right. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm talking here with Huel Griffiths, who is the MD of APD Resolutions Limited. And I've just been having a warm up chat with him. And he's revealed the fact that he's not at all interested in politics. Um, he didn't say that it was anything to do with what's been happening in those circles recently, but um, you know, we can have our own opinions. What I'd like to do is to start off now going right to the point where I know Huel as being Welsh, very Welsh and proud of it. Um, he's had a fascinating life so far and now with his business, um, the fire in his belly that he told me about a long time ago, which he calls in Welsh, I believe it's Hoyle. Yes, Hoyle, Hoyle that's correct. Hoyle. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, he, he has a very powerful sense of right or wrong. And he's also a family man. So looking at these conditions then, um, Hugh, when are you going to write your book, your biography? What a fabulous question. And <laughs> that tells me that you probably know me a lot better than you think you know me because I've actually been writing my life story for the last 10 years. Um, and it, I wanted it to initially coincide with leaving the Middle East um, because it was something that I didn't want to put out uh, for sale while I was still working in the Middle East. But um, my life has continued to be very interesting, um, even after I left the Middle East. So there are chapters still to be written. Um, but I am writing my life story, and it is called um, Poems and Anecdotes, um, the journey of, the, uh, the journey of, um, of a poor man because um, of, of my background. But as I write a lot of poetry, as I go th through my journey for life, I'm actually aligning the poems with um, situations that have happened to me um, in my life. And uh, so I've, uh, the, the whole book will be poems aligned with uh, anecdotal uh, experiences of Hewell Griffiths during many periods of my life. Thank you very much. Well, that's a that's an intriguing answer. Um, a, I had no idea that you had already <laughs> started. Um, B, it gives me some sort of uh, good feeling that I'm heading in the right direction, perhaps, with some of the questions. But anyhow, we'll see. Going back a bit further from your business, going back to the days when you were working in Saudi Arabia, which I believe it was about 30 odd years, wasn't it? About 30 years? Um, I went out there initially January the 11th, 1980. Right. Knowing so that... It was 35, um, 36 years altogether. Right. Gosh, that's a long time, isn't it? That's a, that's a lifetime and a half anyhow. And that's yeah. just w one <laughs> career. <laughs> okay. yeah. Well, the other point is, we all know that the Middle East was a, a hotbed of you know, problems, uh, mm -hmm. political to, um, well, to, to, to citizens' uh, rights and things like this. And um, I know also how much you had to um, work with the Saudis in order to, um, A, respect them, and B, to keep the peace, as it were. But did you ever have any near trouble while you were in the Middle East, and did you witness any activities that might have been a bit hostile? Oh, yes, indeed. Um, May the 29th, uh, 2004, probably the, the worst 24 hours of my entire life. Um, if you were to look up on Google that date, you will hear that it was the Koba um, attack um, and it was a day that started off I was already in work at um, 6 15 I received a telephone call from a friend of mine I happened to be a Welsh friend of mine who was also working in Cobar he called me and uh, 
said, I just wanted to know if you're at work because I think you should be back with your wife. And I said, what's going on? And he was just um, turning into the car park of the building where he worked in Coba. And he saw six guys uh, dressed with Kalashnikovs running into the building. Uh, so he turned around and went back home. And it was the start of the whole event for that day. It was um, horrific. Um, there were a lot of friends that unfortunately aren't with us anymore. Um, huge amount of people left Koba as a result of that. I went back home so I could spend some time with Jude, who was eight months pregnant um, at the time. Um, and um, overnight, we had um, tracers coming into the garden from the street where they were attacking our guards on the compound. Um, and I'm sitting there trying to protect my wife with a big bertha in my hand and thinking what in the ridiculous situation we were in when there were people running around the compound with guns. Um, so that was probably the worst um, situation I ever found myself in, in the Middle East. Um, but yeah, you know, part of this is, is in the book. Um, um, oh, right. So, so I, if I, promise if you, I promise you I haven't <laughs> taken a sneak look. But uh, no, no. Yeah, that's, no, that's, um, that's, that's hair-raising, isn't it? But, but it was it was horrendous. I, I don't think anybody, unless you go through a situation like that, you just cannot begin to imagine the helplessness. Yeah. And it was helplessness because, you know, if uh, if I had been sitting there even with a gun in my hand and we were being attacked, at least you feel as if maybe something could be done but you're just sitting there and you've yeah. got this golf club in your hand and you've got someone sitting next to you who's eight months pregnant and trying to keep calm and uh, horrendous it was wow. just a horrendous a horrendous night the whole Look, 24 thank, hours thank you for answering so openly on that and i hope i haven't sent you into some kind of um you know you know frenzy still thinking about it no, not at all. We, we've we've come to terms with it. It was, but it was a very very long time. Yeah, you know, we, we, people talk here about the lockdown and stuff, but after that happened, um, the baby was born a month later, literally a month to the day later, um, and then we had three months that we had to wait until the all the paperwork and the passport was done for the baby before we were allowed to leave um, the country, and we never left the house. Um, I would go shopping every now and then just to make sure that we had food and stuff, but um, the uh, Jude and, and the baby never left the house at all. Um, and that was for three whole months. So, yet, you know, this, this is, this really isn't anywhere near as, um, as awful as the situation we found ourselves in then. Indeed. Well, and yet you're so able to talk about your Saudi experience generally as being a fantastic mm -hmm. experience. Absolutely. I mean, it, you know, the, these things happen. You know, there are millions of people on, on a daily basis that um, go through trauma. Um, we had that, I suppose you could say it was for, for three months. Um, you know, I had a couple of other incidents while I was out there. Um, in 1992, um, I went on strike um so there was uh, you, there was that you went yeah. on strike that's, i went on strike in saudi arabia that which was something, sound like you <laughs> well uh, they were trying to change my contract they were trying to change my contract well who do you um, strike against i mean <laughs> well i know i stopped working ah right I stopped, yeah i stopped working uh, and the funny thing is that uh, um <clears throat> You are actually part of, of the story because um, what happened, so it's a little bit early, probably 1988, not 1992. There's, this, yeah. there's, another, there's another incident in 1992. But um, I was given a contract. I took my first family out there. Um, so my first wife had given up a job in the UK. My, my children were in school in Jeddah. Um, we'd been out there about six months on a two 
year contract. I'd rented out the house back in the UK. And one day the British Council turned up and said, we have changed your contract. You're all going to go on single status. Your family has got to go home, um, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I um, sat there and the gentleman who was in charge of us at the time, you also met because we worked together. Um, it was a Scottish gentleman named Reese, and you know him very well. So I said, what are we going to do? And he says, what can we do? And I said, I'm not accepting this. And I then started looking for work. Um, and I sent out lots and lots of um, applications. And I got a phone call from a gentleman called Harry Wright from ICL, um, suggesting that they might be interested in employing me. And um, uh, I ended up going back on a weekend, if you remember, to to the UK. I met up with yeah. you at Stevenage uh, well, I know. train station and then had the interview. And uh, then I started working with yeah. with you for a couple of years. Well, I never, I, I really don't so, remember that being, I didn't do, by the way, I didn't change the sink to the single status. I didn't have anything to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but the, the point was that when I went back, because when, when I accepted that job, I was due to start with you guys mm. um, in May. Um, and yes. uh, so I went back and I handed in my resignation and they said, we're not accepting your resignation. And I said, I'm sorry, but, you know, I'm allowed to give 30 days. You can give me 30 days. I'm giving you 30 days. And they refused. Um, and in fact, not my boss, but my boss's boss actually said to me that he wanted me to um, go and get the passports of my family, a wife and three children, and give them to him, which basically meant he was going to be holding them mm -hmm. prisoners um, why, until I complied with their wishes. <laughs> so I went and picked her up from school, picked the children up from school, took them to the airport that night, um, managed to get four tickets on Lufthansa from somebody who was prepared to sell me the tickets at an extortionate price. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. And I got them on the plane that night. You so were so lucky were... then. Well, it, it, well it, I mean, the you... situation is that most a lot of people would have just complied. And I, and I wasn't prepared to. I wasn't prepared to. <laughs> um, and, you know, it did put me in a difficult situation. Because, you know, every single day I was petrified that they would throw away the key uh, yeah. while I was still there. Yeah. But, you know, my family had to go home because we rented out the house. They had to live in a caravan in Treco Bay for three months while we sorted out um, other accommodation. It, 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 but these <laughs> things happen. Um, <laughs> they do. And, and at, and, you know, and at the end of the day, I came back and then I started working with you guys on July the 11th and uh, off we went. Well, I'm impressed the fact that you remember the dates as well. But I, I suppose if you had traumas like that, it, it does impress upon you. Um, well, I remember the date of the uh, interview was May the 8th. <laughs> right, you are. Well, there are, there are quite a few things I remember the dates of. Um, Interestingly, <laughs> but it's uh, not but, uh, interviewing you but also. It's nothing anything to do with this. Uh, but the thing is, we got got a lot of value for our money on that question. Thank you very Thank much you. for for explaining that. You, you you even you even learned the language at one point, didn't you? You, you Malahi. At least you started. If you didn't finish, sorry. Did you did you did you learn the language? Did you learn it? Um, I can I can hold a conversation in Arabic. Well, that's, that's I cannot that's... read. I cannot read Arabic. Um, it, uh, but I did try. One of the difficult parts of going out there, especially when I went out in the eighties, was that very very few people spoke English at all, and what they wanted to do was to learn to speak English. Yeah. Yeah, as yeah. soon as you sat down with somebody yeah. and said, let's have a conversation in Arabic. They said, no, 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 no. English, English, yeah. Mr. Mr. Tell me English. Tell me. Yeah. So very, very quickly, it became very, very difficult yeah. for you to, to have a conversation other than, you know, I, I'd go down to the souks, to the markets and um, 
uh, and I would then be yeah. learning Arabic, talking in Arabic when I was, um, you know, buying things and so forth. So, you know, the 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 living part of uh, of the Arabic was was great, but actually trying to get people to to talk Arabic to you, um, they were they were far more interested in learning mm. English because um, yeah. they knew how how things were were going to turn out over the next uh, twenty years or so. Well, you. What makes you so competitive? <laughs> hmm. I, I think it's my background. I think it's my background, and yeah. uh, you know, I, you know, I come from a, a very poor, poor, uh, poor background, um, and so I've always had to to fight for everything. I mean, we. Mm. It, it it amazes me. In fact, I read an article today about um, a family that have spent three thousand pounds on gifts for their eighteen-month-old child. That child is not even going to remember um, this Christmas, and they've already spent three thousand pounds. Why would you do that? Now we had absolutely nothing um, uh, at Christmas. My dad would be making stuff for us. You know, I remember getting a sword one year, which was just two pieces of wood and a, and a nail. Um, but that's the way that it was. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I had to fight for everything. Mm. And um, I was very fortunate for whatever reason. I was blessed with a little bit of intellect. Yep. Uh, and in our county, um, if you came from a poor background and you were male, and he did really well in the 11 plus. They offered you a place in the local private or local public school. So I I went to Tutlandovi, which was a, a public school in Carmarthenshire. Um, but even that was difficult because um, I had gone there and my parents were not paying for anything. Mm -hmm. So the children of parents who were paying um, took umbrage at that and therefore I was I was bullied for a very very long time um, simply because uh, you know circumstances were beyond my control uh, yeah. Yeah. it was nothing to do with me the fact that uh, my parents weren't paying uh, for yeah. the privilege of being in the school but um, they took umbrage at that um, so it seems as if I've always had to fight um, yeah. and overcome. So when you have that sort of mentality and then you get into doing sports and stuff where you obviously have to overcome, that mentality is already there. Um, you know, I, I think when, when it really reared its head and I became most aware of it was when I was 50. Up until then, uh, I had I had found that side that side of me sometimes I didn't like because I fought so hard, but just acceptable. <clears throat> and then when I was 50, I was playing in a squash tournament, a squash match, um, and the captain of the team asked me if I would play in a position that was beyond me. I should not have been playing number two uh, because I was more of a sort of a four of a five level. But he desperately wanted to beat the other team. And so he said, will you sort of be a sacrificial lamb? Will you go in at number two? <laughs> because um, oh, we yeah. should win at least two of, you know, of four and five if you're playing at number two. And we always knew our number one was unbeaten. Nobody could beat him at all. So we knew we had a point from... Uh, our number one, and we were hoping from a part for a point from four and five. Well, number five won the match. Number four lost the match. Number three, we always knew was going to be touch and go. Um, and what happened was number three lost. So I'm walking onto the court, playing against the Wales under eighteen number four player, who was um, obviously young. He's only about seventeen, but he was about six foot four, and you could just tell how fit he was. And I'm supposed to be a sacrificial lamb. I'm supposed to lose. Um, and I just could not. Um, and it was it, a squash match usually lasts around 40, 45 minutes. The first game was 45 minutes. 
Um, and even at the end of that game, I was purple. Um, I was on my knees, but I just, <laughs> I just would not give in. Yeah. And Jude was watching upstairs and she turned around to me and said, please just get off the court. And I said, no, <laughs> um, we've got to win this. Um, and uh, eventually after nearly two hours, um, I remember sinking on my knees. I managed to beat him in the, in the final game. Um, and uh, I just knew um, it had to stop. And uh, well, because it, it really nearly did, did kill me. And, 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 and Jude turned around and said, don't ever, ever do that to me yeah. again. And um, so up until then, um, I was very, very competitive. And I believe firmly believe it came from my background. So it's your background that's, that's really driven you into this competitive Absolutely. stuff. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. The, the, the you whole, know, it, must, it, drive, must, yeah. it must be painful sometimes looking back to these events and remembering how, you know, how painful it can be. So why don't you look forward just for a moment with this question anyhow, you know, what would you like to be doing? What, what, what would you like to be involved with in the future? And why? Instead of instead of doing what you're doing now, or rather, when you finish doing what you're doing in the future. Okay. Well, I, I think I need to um, really share <coughs> my situation, maybe now a little oh. bit more with yourself. Okay. I am. <laughs> I, I I am a MD of ABD Resolutions Limited. Limited to me means living the dream, right? That's what LTD means. And I am living the dream. Uh, I help people now that I want to help, that I'm able to help because I want to do that rather than because I have to do that. So right. I'm not competitive now at all. So I, you're, I don't, you're looking to give, to give back give something back as this, this is all giving back if you see behind me there right i'm doing a webinar tomorrow morning and if i move my head well, yeah i can see yeah it's free okay um I, i'm doing webinars um i'm helping people um how to build their their own businesses um and oh, i'm doing right. as much as i can of stuff it, it's it is giving back i've That's been working amazing. with this with the local schools um, as an enterprise advisor, that's all my own time giving back because I'm able to. And I think what the competitiveness has done for me is put me in a position that, um, which I'm very grateful for, it's put me in a position where I am able to, to help, um, help people. I wish, if, if, when you talk about the future, if I wish anything, it would be that I am so comfortable that I can do even more for people because, you know, I've been so fortunate along the way. Um, I've been helped by so many people, including yourself. And um, I just love giving back. And if I could spend every hour of every day giving back, I would. Um, I, it's, it's really great that I am, um, you know, I do help some businesses and, and they pay me for the privilege of, of me helping yeah. them, which is great. Um, I but, see. Uh, I, I wasn't aware of that, but, uh, yeah, that's, but that, no, well, that's no. amazing. That's a sort of an intuitive mm -hmm. thing that I've picked up uh, somehow. Mm -hmm. And um, I realized that you probably would want to do something different. Having, well, if you put all together all your competitiveness, uh, your experience, the, the wide ranging experiences that you've had. Uh, I'd be very surprised if there wasn't another thing in, in the pipeline, as it were. Um, but the, the point writing is, is, is another thing. Writing. Um, yeah. if, I, if, if I'm not able to help uh, in the way that I'm doing now, then yeah. actually writing um, to help people is, is the next thing that I would really like to, but I'm not, I'm not a sit downer, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a guy that likes to get up and, and yeah. do things. Yeah. Um, but you have to sit down but, to write. 
well, that's what I mean. Oh, right. I that's see. what I mean. I am not a sit downer. So yeah. um, while I um, have this attitude of wanting to get out there and do things, yeah. um, that it, that is not something that I am taking a lot of time over. I prefer to be involved in in any shape or form right. before I dedicate my time just to sitting in front of a computer and, and writing. Well, look, it's you, just you, not something that I like to do. You can't, time. In the end, you'll probably find that you can't carry on giving either uh, without having some kind of recognition. So my question is, what would you like to be recognized for? You know, when you look I back would, through your life? somebody who was prepared to help in any way shape or form i mean the reason that i called myself solution man is because you throw a situation at me and i will find a solution for you um, and that is what that's what i want to be known as and, and you know the people that know me know me well they will pick up the phone and say, "You will. I, I, I've got this problem. What would you do? How can you help?" And that's what I. That's what I like to be remembered for. And the final question, and this is the number seven question. <laughs> Hopefully, you'll continue with, you know, the exciting life that you've got, uh, still have, mm -hmm. with your family and your friends, and, mm -hmm. and the business interests. And um, certainly lots of stories uh, about sport, even if you weren't going to be doing much of it. Apart from golf, uh, you didn't tell me much about golf. Are you still going to be doing golf? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> my dad, my so. dad, you know, you, you, you've met my dad. My dad is 89, okay? I introduced yeah. dad to golf when he was 69. And the one thing that the pair of us can't wait for um, when all of this nonsense is finished is to go back out and have a round of golf together. Um, Marvellous. We, we always we go out half a dozen times a year, so this year has been awful because I've only gone out with him once. Um, but I want to, you know, yeah. at the age of 90, be the same as my dad. I want to be going out there and having a round of golf. And I would like to also um, share this story about my dad. I was talking to somebody about him yesterday. <laughs> Two years ago, um, we turned up at the same, we always played the same golf course, but they'd never had any buggies. Um, and then they started bringing in buggies for the course. So I'm driving up with my dad next to me and I said, oh, look, dad, there are buggies over there. And I won't tell you exact words he said, but he said, there is no way I am going in a buggy. And he was 88 at the time. So... <laughs> That's how I hope that uh, I will be as <laughs> Good well. Good for him. So I take it, you know, uh, there's a certain degree of a chip off the old block inside you, you know, mm. and, and in fact now you're you're the best of friends is instead of just father and son. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah. you know, you're doing... Well, he's my hero anyway. Oh, oh well, there you are. Mm. But finally then, so what plans do you have for that magical word retirement? There is no magical word retirement. But it's magical. Uh, and honestly, uh, you know, I, and I don't want that to sound churlish or anything, because to me, retirement is living the dream. <laughs> but, you know, a lot of people. Oh. Think that retirement is let's stop working. Retirement, that's all that retirement is. It means that you have changed your situation from having to depend on somebody else or having to get money from somewhere else in order for you to have the lifestyle that you want. So as far as I'm concerned, I just want to continue living the dream. Again, talking about my dad. My dad was still working uh, three, year, three or four years ago. Um, in fact, my, my dad was the go-to in the village. So there were people who um, wanted to have their lawns cut. They call my dad up and they pay him for cutting the lawn, cutting the hedges, even putting out their bins. He was talking to me one day saying, you're not going to believe me, Hugo, but there's a new family moved in across the road 
and they've asked me to put their bins out um, every Thursday morning and they're paying me £10 every time I do it. And you think, <laughs> this is just, <laughs> but that, that's, so, so to, to me, there is no such thing as retirement. And what you do is you just change your lifestyle um, and you continue to, or you now start having, having the type of lifestyle that you've always dreamed about. Um, you know, you, you go away on um, breaks every time. I mean, last year I had six breaks during the year. Uh, some of them were holidays with the family. Others were going on golf tours with, uh, with groups of people. Yeah. You, ju you just have the type of lifestyle that you want. That is what retirement is as far as I'm concerned. Um, and oh, to be yeah. honest with you, I've, I've had too many friends who have stopped working and unfortunately aren't with us anymore. Yeah. Because yeah. when you stop, you stop. And I have no intention of stopping. <laughs> well, you've given us lots of entertainment with your answers here. And Bless what you. I'd like to do is to say thank you very much for, um, you know, facing up to them. That, that <laughs> I think, was a big competition there. And it, it, it appears as though you've won again. Um, <laughs> and we've ended up on the word retirement. And there's just no resolution to that one but what no. we have found out and what i think i found out even if we can't give your autobiography this title <laughs> at least we can give the video the name of living your dream yeah living the dream ltd living, living the dream yeah limited yeah